Is that on now? Yep. Okay, folks, let's try to get uh, situated. We have several seats over here, more seats in here, more seats over here. No, I was just showing Tim. Place he could come. They even have an overseer of sound. <laughs> uh, lots of seats right down in here. Lots of them. There you go. That's a good one. Yeah. It's good to see each of you this evening, and we appreciate the presence of everyone. We have a couple with us from Northern Ireland, from Bangor. Correct? Got it right? We're certainly glad to have you with us this evening. And uh, Ireland's a wonderful place to visit. I've taken several groups to Ireland and uh, I enjoy it very much. Uh, the only problem I had was Shane Castle was closed. Yeah, you know about Shane Castle? That was associated with Alexander Campbell's mother. And uh, I saw other places associated with Alexander and Thomas and wanted to see that one and they were filming their uh, movies or something so nobody could get in and we couldn't even go to the front to get a picture of it either so any big buildings called a castle right just about something like that nice to see each of you uh, Guthrie would you lead us in a prayer and ask the Lord to help us tonight There are many places to get good photographs if you go to the Bible lands. First is the land itself and the things that you see there. And then there are specialized places. There are places like uh, uh, animal reserves. There is one in southern Israel, almost to Elot, that has animals that they have brought in, people who have studied the matter carefully, have brought in from other places in the world now back to where they believe they were also growing originally. And the only problem is that you can go and see things there and then you go back and those things aren't there. So I said, where are the Ibex? They said, well, they jumped the fence. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't there. And there was something else. Oh, I, they didn't, they'd had some reptiles also and I uh, went back and the reptiles were all gone. So that can happen. There are places that show us the kind of terrain and that are in the kind of terrain. They're in the biblical country and the biblical terrain. And they also will have these uh, uh, fields that are just like they were in Bible times where it's planted with the same sort of things and uh, having... Uh, where places where they could uh, and so on and so that's very helpful and I'll have several of those this evening that I think you'll find helpful and this one comes from Nazareth village and Nazareth village was built in Nazareth it's mostly a quote Christian town 
rather than a Muslim town, though many of the people are Arab who live there and who are, quote, Christian. You understand the broader use of that that we find lots of places. And uh, so these people operate the Nazareth village. And it's really a marvelous place to see. And that's what uh, this young lady is doing. She is there showing how they did the weaving and so on in Bible times. And I'll have more of, of things like this. Then I wanted to show you tonight this thing about what happens to the tourists in Bible lands. They pose for their pictures, you know. Uh, Vicki, that's the boy that you married. <laughs> I told her I had a special picture for her tonight. <laughs> so at any rate, most of you know these people. Those two Italians on the left, all of these were my students. And so that's Johnny Berdini. He's been here recently. And that's uh, Stefano Carazza and uh, David Tomley. And you know the other one. So <laughs> anyway, we'll move on past that and go to some of these other things. Uh, who sent the, who gave me this? Guthrie gave me this, right? Who gave me this picture? Sent it, who sent it to me? Who? Nerland. Is he here? No. Anyway, he said he found that somewhere online. Well, what it looks like to me is it's, a, it's from an old, like an old book. And it has been more or less artificially colored. And what you have here is something that is rather nice, and that is that it uh, shows you the terrain. So if you can take a look at the terrain and notice, see there would be the mountain range where Jerusalem is located, right there. Then you have the Jordan Valley right here, Dead Sea, and then you go here in the Transjordan Plateau. So maps like that are helpful. I have a little map of Jerusalem that is a relief map. It's plastic, you know, you buy souvenirs. And so I was going to bring it tonight and show it, and I looked at it, and it was all in French. <laughs> so I already know the terrain, so it didn't matter to me that it was in French. They didn't have it in English, and uh, I didn't bring it. But I've had Paulette helping me, looking on every shelf, twice, three times, four times, to find one that was like this, that was the plastic relief. And that would help you understand a lot about the terrain as you see it here. But also I found some other examples that might be good. This one came from a Bible program that I have called Bible Works. It's no longer printed, no longer used, but I use it all the time. That is, it's no longer maintained. And what I showed you here is just a certain portion of the land. If you'll look over to the left, you'll see the, the coastal plain. There's just some plain along there, not too much. And then does anyone recognize that little hump that goes out into the Mediterranean Sea? That's Mount Carmel. So Mount Carmel is there, and it stretches from the northwest to the southeast, just like the weather comes in, we talked about. You know where, of course, the Jordan Valley is. You know where the Sea of Galilee is located. And then I wanted to show you what we have on this one that illustrates something so clearly. You see right there? That more or less, you know, some curves to it, not a straight line, but that is the Jezreel Valley. And in the New Testament times, sometimes in Greek, it had been called the Estralan Valley, but it's the, we call it typically Jezreel in the Bible, and that's the place. So obviously, when people would travel, they're going to look for these valleys. It is better than going over the hills and going on the top of the mountains. And so they're very important in the things that uh, we do. All right, this is another one that is like this from the Logos Bible software. And it shows a portion that has the Dead Sea, go north, 
you see all the way up to the Sea of Galilee. Notice down at the top of the Dead Sea again, you have Jericho. Jericho is the lowest of all these cities uh, that there is. It's 825 feet below sea level. If you were at Jerusalem, you would be 2,400 feet above sea level. It's only about 19 miles, maybe 17, 18, 19, 20. Depends on if you make a lot of curves, you know, to get there. And so when you come down to Jericho, you are that much further in elevation than at Jerusalem. All right, so now suppose you wanted to go to Jerusalem and you were in Galilee. So what you will find is that many times the people who were in Galilee would go like this. They would travel from, let's say, Nazareth, right there. They would travel down to the valley. They would cross over into this coastal plain of, on the Jordan River. It's not a coastal plain. It's a plain beside the Jordan River in Transjordan. And this is the way they would travel. The area in Roman times was called Perea. And that means across. It means on the other side. So everything is in relation to the promised land. And that is Perea. That's the other side of that. And when you walk down, you come to a place. There are numerous fords where you can go across the river. So it's not the river you saw was very, fairly small and fairly hidden most of the time. And so it's easy to find a place to cross. So when people get to near Jericho, they would cross the river and go to Jericho. And do you remember Jesus' last visit to Jerusalem? That's the way he went, wasn't it? He went up to, from Jericho. He told numerous stories. There was a man who was going down from Jerusalem to where? To Jericho. And he fell among thieves. We may talk about that because that's really something that could happen today very easily. It's, a, it's just you're in the wilderness of Judea. You get off the main road, no telling who you might be. And probably wouldn't be all that pleasant. And I've known people, individuals, I'll tell you about later, maybe, if we get to that, people that actually have had this happen to them. So, as you go down through there, you go to Jericho, and then you've got that distance of you know, maybe 18 miles or so to go up to Jerusalem from 800 feet below sea level to 2,400 feet. And in order to get to the 2,400 feet, you've got to go over the Mount of Olives at 2,600 feet. So that's quite a walk, isn't it? And people who are, uh, you know, really experienced hikers can do that in about seven or seven and a half hours. Roland could do it in five, I'm sure. <laughs> so it doesn't take too long, but it's all day. And do you remember when Jesus was going from, from across the Jordan, he was on the eastern side of the Jordan, and he was going up to the home of Mary, Martha, Lazarus in Bethany, and what does the Bible say about his delaying? He stayed an extra day. And so he stayed an extra day and made sure, I mean, I hate to say it this way, but he made sure Lazarus was good dead before he got there. So there would be no doubt, no question, that he raised a dead man. So it's very interesting to see that and the way the everything operates in connection with that. Now here's uh, just a piece of a map. I got this one out of, uh, uh, this is something that the, I think this came from the American Schools of Oriental Research. 
and uh, they were showing just these portions. It may be from another Bible atlas, and I failed to put that information. I like to always do that, but I want you to see they've, they've turned it a little crooked, and that's okay. But this is the southern portion. So in this southern portion, what we have here, first of all, is the Philistine Plain. See, Right over here is the Mediterranean Sea. So that's we'd turn that up like that if we were going to look at our maps, typically. And here are places like Tel Hesse, Lakish, Ashdod, Ascalon, and so on. Joppa is all the way up here. Tel Aviv is right here by Joppa. So we want to go to, Jer to Jerusalem. It's here. So look at the terrain. Now what is this right here? That's, that's the plain. All right, and then as we come along right here, Ekron, Gat, Tel Irani, and so on. What's that? Shephelah. Right, got it. That's called the lowlands in many of our versions. It's called the hill country in other versions. So the idea is that we have a territory now that's 100 feet, you know, just it undulates, so to speak, and you go down the valley and up in a hill, and finally you reach the mountain range. And you can see the mountain range as it continues to come out right here, right along that and then you come up here and this is the mountain range see it really is a vivid uh, when you realize the, and, and the travel that people had to do and when we take a flat map and we point to the flat map and we say here's Nazareth and here's Jerusalem and let's see let me get my little roller and it was 75 miles down there. Boy, the kid says, but well, dad could make that in less than an hour. The other one says, mama could make it better than that. But what? No, it was a three-day trip minimum. Three-day trip. People typically walked 20 to 22 miles a day. And they were used to walking all the time. So 20, 22 miles, that's all they could walk. It's three days or more to get on to Bethlehem. Of course, there's even a little bit more than that if they came that way. And they may not have come the straight way. They may have gone, as I said, across into Transjordan and then went up from Jericho. And that's a long ways to go. Very difficult indeed. Okay, those are things that will help you. Last time we were talking about how things were different in uh, Israel, or what's going to be Israel, the promised land, than they were in the land of Egypt. And so we talked about the fact that they would water it by foot. And I don't know what that means, and hardly anybody knows what it means, but somehow or the other, it had to be manual labor, so to speak. Does manual mean your hands only? Yeah. So anyway, but you know the foot whatever you get. Somehow they watered it with the work that they had to do. And I think I showed you this picture of the Pelusiac branch of the Nile. There are five branches of the Nile River that make form the delta that go to the Mediterranean Sea. And they come down like this in a triangle and then the Jordan Valley. And the Jordan Valley, maybe later a little bit more about that, not the Jordan Valley, the Nile Valley, the Nile Valley can be anywhere from a mile or two miles to as much as 10 miles wide with vegetation on one side and maybe not the other, or a little vegetation on either side. I've flown that a few times when we would go to um, Luxor and pick up a cruise and go to ask one and so on so it's very interesting to look down there and see that sometimes you have on one side of the plain as you're right over the river and you look over here and there's no vegetation just desert on this side you look and there's a little bit it may stretch a mile 
it might stretch five or ten miles, but that doesn't last very long. And so the expression again, everybody knows this one, you did it great the other night. So we say Egypt is the what? Red box, that's right. Well, what else? It is the what of the gift of the Nile. Because it, without the Nile River, they would have learned long ago how to desalinate water. <laughs> but, you see, they've got the Nile River. So they're able to do that. Okay, now, moving on further. There are fields like this in the land of Goshen. Goshen is a flat area, and Goshen is a fertile area. So the territory that the children of Israel lived in was one of the best areas that there was. The Egyptians didn't live in it much. They didn't care much for these people. Remember what it says about them? They didn't like the people who had livestock. And so this is the land of Goshen with just crops or hay. This is to provide for cattle mostly. And I'll show you that. So here's just another place where I don't know what these two these trees are left here or they've just been placed here. These trunks have been placed here. And uh, what's going on here, and I've got two or three pictures that will show you this, is that the cattle that are standing alongside this, they're there for one purpose. What is the purpose? Oh, maybe two purposes. They provide milk. You know, it's to make fertilizer. Yeah, that's it. So they're here to make fertilizer. This lady from Huntsville, Alabama, that area. And so she made that picture, I guess, as we were driving along from the bus or as we stopped somewhere. And you can see that's exactly an over and over and over. And if you'll look, you'll see that all of these, if you, some, I don't see it on all of them, but it's there somewhere. You'll see, see what's that right there. They're tied. All they do is stand there and eat all day long and make fertilizer. So that's what makes the crops there. And this is the way it is. Has time changed? over these last 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years? Not too much there. Not too much. Oh, yes, there are people who have nice cars. Yeah. I went to a place one time, a guy insisted that we go with, uh, we, he'd been with us that day, and uh, just my wife and I, and he insisted that we come eat with them. So, we told him, no, <laughs> we had a... <laughs> We said, no, that's okay. Our meal is paid for at the hotel. We'll go ahead and eat here. Well, he said, I'll come pick you up after dinner. I said, fine, good. So we go along. We go down a little alley, not far from the pyramids of Giza. And we go along there, and I think, well, where are we going here? A little narrow road. It'd be hard for two cars to pass, but they could do it if they slowed down. And then all of a sudden, he drives up to this place that has this gate that's, you know, about so high. And somebody, he honks his horn. Somebody opens the gate. He pulls up on a really nice paved area. And there's a brand new Mercedes sitting there. And it's a four-story house. Because why? There are four generations living in that house. And so he and his wife with his mother, live on the ground floor. The son lives up here, the second son lives up here, and the third son lives up here. And one of them had that new Mercedes. They said, this thing cost $125,000 here with taxes. Now you can't go by what you look at on the street because you'll find that people really are different when it gets into their home. And I've been in another home also where you go in, you walk up the steps, and oh, they are so dirty. You think, how do people live in this? Why am I even doing this? You knock on the door. The people downstairs have called. It's a little shop downstairs. They've called up to tell him that I'm coming. He was the first guy I ever had in Egypt. So 
we go there, we knock on the door, he opens the door, and we're glad to see him, he's glad to see us. And his wife was sick, we knew that. But he said, come in, I want you to see my wife. We went into the living room, and in the living room, there was, I mean, sofas, easy chairs, and so on. They make sure, unlike in my house, they make sure that there is a seat for every member of the family. And the family comes and gathers there, and everybody has a nice chair or sofa to sit on. So you see, you can judge things by the outside, and oftentimes that's wrong, isn't it? But I'm not preaching tonight. <laughs> I'll tell, tell Don that he can use it. <laughs> so anyway, here we go with the herds. Now, it says it's a land that you're going to, and we looked at this one already. This is a land that is different. He says it is a land that is going to be one that uh, uh, will not be like this place you've lived here. This has been difficult for you when you've been living down here. But of course there's going to be 40 years, but that's, a, that's, that's another thing. That's going to come along a little bit later. And so he says it's going to have hills and valleys. You'll drink the water. They drink the water from the rain of heaven. It's a land which the Lord your God cares for which he cares. And the eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning even to the end of the year. Now even with what we've studied thus far in mind, can you think of a reason why God chose that land as the promised land? Who wants to give me the answer to that? Why did he choose that land as the promised land. Why didn't he promise them the desert of Egypt? What? Difficult? Egypt would have been. You're answering the second question, not the first. You can't go out of order, Tim. <laughs> why, why did he choose that land? Yes, God used those countries to punish them. That's a good thought. But I think there's something a little more basic than this. I thought I saw a hand. I thought there's something that's more basic than this. Well, that's, that's a good point, too. He wanted to bless them. And some would, you know, raise the question, is it really a blessing to live there, I mean, in that land, with such a narrow place and so little area to grow crops? Would it really be the best place? Does it have anything to do with the fertile crescent? He put them in a place where all, all the major countries would cross it, right? If you were in Babylon, you were in Assyria, you were in Syria, you were in Egypt, and you started to fight one of these others, where would you, how would you travel there? Right through the promised land. So it also became, and go on to New Testament times, which in the Bible is referred to as Brent, the New Testament time is referred to as the what? Yeah, you know. What? Last days, but what is the fullness of times? Fullness you knew. Time. Yes, I knew you knew. <laughs> you must have sat be you must have sat behind Roland. So, yeah, the fullness of times. Everything was just right. And why was that? Because now, finally, the Romans came along. And while they were pagan, they said what? 
You can believe and teach what you want to. And you can travel anywhere you want to. And you can do all of these things. You can have one language and everybody will understand it. Isn't it amazing how he did that for it? So that's part of the reason they chose this place. He chose this place. has to be. But it did provide for them. So that's what we want to look at a little bit now. All right, so they had a problem. With these limited mountain ranges and more limited valleys, where are they going to grow their crops? They're going to run out of space. And so they come along, and according to Joshua 17, they said, we need to more land. So they said, clear the forest. You can clear the forest. Well, through the centuries, the forest have been denuded by the other people who came along as well. I mean, let's go a little further up into Lebanon, and the Assyrians and others just took away those great cedars. There are even reliefs. You can see them in the Louvre. There are reliefs showing them cutting the timber, taking it down to the sea, going along with it, then back to land and taking it back and building their palaces and other things with it. So this is going to happen here. All right, so they cleared forest because they didn't have enough space. Look further. Here are important developments that happened along the way. Clearing the, agri the forest to provide agricultural land. That's one we just noted. And then we have terraced farming that came along. This would be in full swing about 1,000 years before Christ. So they're going to build the, take the forest, not, not take the forest, they're going to take the mountains, the hillsides, and they're going to put in terraced farming. You can't build up the side of a mountain, but if you turn it into terraces, lots of work, then you might be able to do so. From the Iron Age, and if I say Iron Age in this case, we're talking roughly 1000 BC, starting, let's say, at the time of David, Solomon, and so on. So from that period on, it's called the Iron Age because iron implements began to make their appearance. And so it would be practiced until now. And in the Negev, which is the south land or the southern part of the country, the dry part, they used runoff farming. And I'll show you illustrations of that. So here are some terraces. I saw this in Lebanon and I thought, Wow, that's a good illustration of the terraces. And you see the terraces there. There's a waterfall over in the distance there. And you can see you go up. And these aren't very big. They're very narrow. But nonetheless, it's a way that you can build and plant several things along the way. And there's a closer view of that particular area. It looks like they're going to plant some small crops on these. You know, something that's really small. And then within this, the walls, this is a statement made in the Job 24, verse 11. And I put three or four versions there, I guess it is, that says this. It says, within the walls, they produce oil. They tread wine presses, but thirst. That's the New American Standard Bible. Look at the NIV. They're trying to make this clear to people that don't know about this. It says they crush olives among the terraces. See, that's they make oil. They crush olives. They tread the wine presses, yet suffer thirst. The New Revised Standard Version says between their terraces they press out oil. That's the olives. They tread the wine presses. That's the grapes. But they still suffer thirst. So they don't have enough space. They don't have enough place yet. They're still working on it. Job was one of the early books, and even that's before the Iron Age, but perhaps they had that. There's a gentleman named uh, Oded Barosky. He uh, wrote a book on, agri this is an article, Agriculture in the Iron Age, 
but there are also some books on this subject where he talks about it. And he's showing how they do this and what is done in this case. You see down here, what you've done is fill in with some, like we would fill in some potting soil, let's say. Well, the potting soil's up here. This is a lot of gravel, small rocks, and so on. And then you put soil on top of that, olive tree growing. Then you go up higher, another level, another level, another <coughs> level. So that's the way they built these terraces for the farming. And, believe it or not, you can still see these in the country today. At the Nazareth village that I mentioned to you, they have this nice diagram showing how it was done in the Roman times. I didn't finish about Nazareth village. They literally bought a piece of land or they somehow secured a piece of land that had been a farm. They know a farm was there. And so they used this farm then and they have everything. I mean, they have the shepherd and the sheep they have olive trees. They have a few vineyards, not, not, not many grapes, but a few. They have a watchtower. They have a, an olive press so that you can see how olives are pressed. They have a synagogue. They have a little bit of everything there that you can see in an hour's time. And it's really wonderful because it gives you ideas about these things that you didn't know about before. So look, you've got to pick up the rock. Got it? Got to pick up all these. Sorry, son. My back's bothering me. <laughs> so somebody picks them up, and when they pick them up, they're going to stack them up like this. See? Now, what's in behind there? Nice soil down in the bottom. What do you have? More rocks, loose rocks, because why? It holds the moisture. So we've got the moisture there. And that's a way that uh, it can uh, be suitable. You put in some really nice of this uh, soil on top of it. Now here's what. You put these rocks up. I can't even put my hand in my pocket. We'll have to move this uh, next time. Uh, here are more rocks picked up from the fields. And then the same thing happens there that happened down here. Now we have olive trees. Okay? And it can go on up the hillside like that. Oh, you say, that's a pretty picture, but are there any real places like that? Ah, I knew you'd ask. In the Hebrew, there are two words that are used to describe these terraced areas. In Ezekiel, there's one word that says the steep pathways will collapse and every wall will fall to the ground. And another word is used in 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 4 and it calls them, it mentions the fields of the Kidron. Where is the Kidron? It's in Jerusalem. And so it is the valley between the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. And so we think of that as the Kidron, and also there's a reference to the fields of Heshbon, that's in Transjordan, where the city of Heshbon is located. All right, that's Borowski's work on that. This is the Kidron Valley. We are right here where you see these shadows, like that. Those are the shadows from a iron fence that is in the front of the Church of All Nations. That is the traditional Gethsemane. All right, so we've got Gethsemane on the slopes of what mountain? Mount of Olives. Olive it. Okay? All right, so then from here we look across and we have these trees. See? They're olive trees. And it doesn't show it so much on this side. But look over here. That's the wall of the old city of Jerusalem. That's the eastern wall. And look here. You see that? 
Now, these don't go back 3,000 years. But again, what are they doing? They're making it just like the Bible said it was. See what I meant? Remember how I told you about some other things that they would do that way? They would, uh, they'd, if they had cattle in the Bible in this town, they put cattle there. If they had grapes, vineyards, they put vineyards there. And so that's what they're doing here. So just like it reads in the scripture, and that's the way they have it today. Because they believe that's the way it was. I do too. Because the Bible says it was. Okay? Now I want to show you something beautiful. <coughs> the day I made this picture, I had a friend with me. We'd, been, we'd stayed over for a week together. And then I left him in Nazareth. And he walked the Jesus Trail. The Jesus Trail goes from Nazareth to Capernaum. So you can go from there, walk three days time to Kim. Now it's not 22 miles a day. Bless his heart. He ran into all kinds of problems. He ran into the east wind bringing dust at him. One night he was so worn out and so tired. He stayed at, a, one, one night at least, he stayed at a goat farm. It was all planned. I mean, it's part of the package you buy to walk the trail. But you've got to do the walking. Nobody does it for you. And so he walks the trail, taking him three days. He gets there. He said, he got in his tent, had a tent to live in. There were evidently a situation where it might be a group of students could come in and they could all sleep in the tent, you know. And so he's in the tent and he stacked up. It was cold at night. And he stacked up the mattresses over here so to help protect him. He got his blanket and put over it. He took his laptop <laughs> Yeah, they, had, they had an electric plug in there and he turned on his laptop and with it under his blanket so he could keep warm. <laughs> and he said, I felt so blessed I couldn't go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we stopped for this picture and it's not something he'd seen on the tour. He'd been with on the but when we stopped there, he said, this is the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Well, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it is pretty, isn't it? What do you see here in this place? You see, what are those? Terraces of all things. No telling how far that goes back. We probably don't know. Probably no one living knows except from whatever archaeological evidence. Now, what do we have down here? What have they done here in this, this little valley? I don't know that word. He calls them spreader dams. So what, we've, what they've done is built, here's a valley, and so what happens when it rains? And coming in from the other direction, what happens? It fills that area. But it'll go on out. So what did they do? They built the little dams there. And that holds that water. And even if you're in the wilderness, you'll see a line of trees where the very last water ran. All right, so now you've got the water in there, right? So water's in there. You're able to maintain your grapes. Of course, you've got gravel and rock down in below there to, you know, where they can grow good. They do that very well in that. Did I move something? I lost something. Okay. And then notice another thing. Uh, you have the vineyard here. See the vineyard. And then see these going across. And see the rocks there. Rocks here. And so on. All of those places. 
So people still do that, just like that. And that's, that's called runoff farming, the idea of hold, keeping the water that is there. Quickly, some of these pictures, and we won't come back to this. Here's a man hoeing in the field. Look at the rocks. Mind you of anything Jesus taught about? It's all over the country. It's like that. Rocks, rocks. First trip I ever took, the guide said, there's a story that I want to tell you about this place. Said that an angel was given the responsibility of delivering seven bags, tremendous bags, of rocks over the earth. And he forgot and dropped six of them on Israel. <laughs> there's a lot of rock there. And you can see it in these fields. This is, this is between Hebron and Beersheba also, or Hebron and Bethlehem, rather. And grapes are growing there. Here's a watchtower. You see the watchtower up at the top? So the watchtower is there. That is so you can stay there in the, when it's so hot and you get in out of the, out of the heat and so on. And I'll pick up with that next time, Lord willing. Thank you for being here. What a wonderful group of people. What's that? <laughs>